Hey you, thank you for being here today. Today's episode, it's entitled, Faith or Fear, Win or Lose, Which Will You Choose? I want to encourage your faith, maybe in a way that you've never known. Or even if you have, I hope that the testimony of my story will give your faith the boost it needs that will inspire you to believe bigger than you have lately. Those of you who may have lost hope and feel lonely and may be dealing with a lot of fear and anxiety for whatever the reasons may be, I want to encourage your hope to rise and for you to know that better days and happiness will be ahead when you begin to allow your faith to be stirred up. I am sharing how my big faith journey began. I have shared with you that my early childhood was filled with confidence and happiness and love. This time in my life is my go-back-to place, my place of reference of what I feel that God has intended me to be like and for me to be to other people. Before I was born, my daddy was only 19 years old when his father died. They farmed together. It was their dream, their passion, and they were well-known farmers because they were very good at what they did. My father, he had to quit school after eighth grade to farm with his father and help the family. When my daddy was only 24 years old, he was very sick and in the hospital, and he had to have lung surgery. The doctors told him that he would die within five years if we didn't move to drier climate. So when I was only four years old, my parents had to move 1,600 miles from all of their family from the life they had known, and start completely over again. It was really, really tough. It's not like we had a choice to move. We had to move. Life was hard on my parents. My father really missed his farming life, and he struggled to find his new place in this world. He found it more difficult to find a job on an eighth grade education and seeing him struggle with that fact was the reason that I wanted to pursue a higher education, to simply break that curse that hurt our family. As a young wife and mother, my mother missed the support of her family, and living so far away was lonely and hard. As for me, once going to school, my life changed a lot. I didn't really like school, and the experiences I had as a child with certain competitive classmates and certain teachers who had them as their teacher's pets, well, let's just say school wasn't very likable for me. But long story short, we made it, and things worked out. But through the process, I didn't want to add any more worry and concern, and so I kept things to myself. I watched my daddy every week sit at the table with it covered in bills. My parents worked and paid every bill on that table. They never filed bankruptcy. They had all of these medical bills to pay, and we were drinking out of canning jars. My brother and I, we didn't have a television to watch. We hardly had any toys. The only things that we had was what my dad could pack in the back of his pickup truck. And later, once he found a job and then moved into a bigger place for us and saved up his money for airline tickets, he sent for us. My parents, they worked really hard, but they made it and they made it on their own. Life is a battlefield. Someone or something is always waiting for the opportunity to take us off that playing field. And you know, the more will we have to be there, the harder it's going to be for those things and those people wanting to conquer us to accomplish tackling us to the ground. And this is why building up and maintaining our faith is so important. You do this by literally getting up and putting on your armor of God each day. 
So let's go over it as we suit up. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, meaning human, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on your full armor of God, so that when the evil day comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up your shield of faith, and with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all of the Lord's people. I was raised in church. You have more than likely heard the saying, I was a drugged Christian. Well, that was me because most of the time it was about my mother by herself struggling but succeeding in dragging we three kids to church. I knew God all of my life because of her. It was the most important foundation that she could lay for our lives and the greatest gift in life as well. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Start or train your children off on the way that they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. In fact, at seven years old, I decided to make the decision to follow Christ and to be baptized. I felt the beauty in that decision even as a young child. But oftentimes, I felt afraid about the things that other people seem to be happy about. I wanted to live out my time on earth and see what would become of my life when they all were wanting to just go to heaven at the moment. I didn't seem to understand what all they were happy about. And that made me feel like maybe something wasn't right about how I felt and that God was probably mad at me for not having what all the other people seemed to have. And then they talked about fear of God. And yes, I felt fear. He wasn't happy with me. I needed someone, like I am now, to explain these things to me and show me the way. All I knew for certain is I couldn't wait to get on with my life. I felt lost like it was hard for me to connect with the rest of the world. I carried a lot of weight on my shoulders that I knew that I shouldn't have as a child. And I prayed for God to send me someone, someone who could understand me and help me go where I needed to go. When I was in sixth grade, I saw him, the man I would marry, and I knew it at that very moment. But how in the world could I know this? So I blew it off. I blew off that thought. I was sitting in church and I saw him taking the offering. I didn't see him again until three years later. Actually, I had forgot about it until then. But this time, we connected. We dated for a year and a half, and we were married when I had just completed my sophomore year of high school. I was 16 years old. A few years later, I realized that I had always been someone, someone. Someone's daughter, someone's sister, someone's wife, and now someone's mother. Who was I? To this point in my life, I felt that people had been telling me what to do or letting me know that I wasn't doing it right. Basically, it meant that I wasn't doing it the way that they did it or thought that I should do it. There were times I felt like someone was waiting to watch me fall or even push me down. After all, there were many who were betting just how long our marriage would last, and it only takes one or two One or two people just talking like that to really drag a person down. So just thinking out loud right now, 
Why can't people just cheer one another on? Why can't people instead celebrate and support the uniqueness of one another? I think there would be a lot less failure in the world if other people just supported one another instead of wagering bets on how long until that person failed. I may be wrong, but I think for the most part, these types of people, they're not sure about their own selves. So they want to basically, you know, they don't want to see you succeed and outdo them. This is why you have to truly know your dream and jump into it and take ownership. Be happy for yourself. So finally, we decided to branch out in life as we began searching for a new church. After all, I had continued to attend the same small church, the only one I had ever known. I still felt that same lost feeling in the atmosphere of our church body, and I didn't feel I was getting anywhere. I didn't feel I was growing. So there just had to be more. And I see now that it simply meant that it was a place that I or we, we just had to discover something else and to be where we needed to be now in our lives. The pastor of our small church, he made a visit to our home. Once he heard that we had found a new church family, he was really upset. That didn't help me, and with what I had been feeling, and in the fact that he simply confirmed my point even further. It was when I was 23 years old and had been married for seven years that my husband came home one Saturday and told me that he was moving out, and I was devastated. Things had been troubling for us, but I was surprised. And like I had always done, I kept to myself. I didn't venture out much, and I took care of our home and our two children. My daddy told me not to worry that he would take care of us, and as much as that should have made me feel better, it didn't. I knew there had to be more to this life than this, and I wasn't finding it. So one evening, I just fell to my knees, and I cried, and I said out loud, Lord, if you are real, please, please take this life of mine. You can have all of it and make it your own, because I sure do not know what to do with it. I've tried. I didn't sleep that night, but instead, when the sun came up, I walked outside, and I found myself looking up. And I really took note of that, that I was walking around with my head down before. But now I held my head high and I felt like someone really special, free and full of life. I realized that my relationship with God was whom I had to be concerned with and he would make all things right. Once I had his forgiveness, all else would be okay because I was right with him. I had never felt this way before. I never felt the way I felt now. I realized that this was my relationship with God and that the two of us determined just how it would be, how good or bad that it could be. And of course, for me, I wanted it to be great. A couple of days later, I was at the sink washing dishes and I was talking and thinking about God. And I said to him, Lord, I know that in the Bible, you healed people, and I believe that today you still do. So, Lord, I want to ask you to heal my marriage. Lord, I don't want my children to be another statistic of divorce. And in his way of speaking to me in my head, I heard him say, Go now and turn on the television to channel 21 and record it so that your husband can one day listen to it as well. I did exactly what I was told. The first words out of the TV were, Today, we are going to talk about born-again marriages. Now, if that wasn't confirmation, then I had to be lying to myself. I was so amazed by what I was hearing. There were broken marriages and life so much worse than mine, 
And yet God healed them all because one of the partners was seeking God to heal their marriage. So I had some real hope here, and I decided to stand in the gap by standing in faith. I also distanced myself from just about everyone but those at church and one other person named John Mentor. John was a pastor at a small church in the desert of Harkahala Valley. He was once married to a very dear and older friend of mine who passed away from cancer a few years earlier, and her name was Sarah John. We called her Johnny. On her deathbed, she had told me that she was praying that one day John and I would be close. I didn't think that that wish would ever happen because there were some things that I didn't like about John. But all of that was about to change, and mainly because a lot of the things that did change in John's life happened after Johnny's passing. I think God was telling Johnny at the time about my future that I didn't see. John was my one person who faithfully stood believing with me for the healing of my marriage. And when I cried, he would listen to my sobbing phone calls regardless of the time. He would pray for me and he would encourage me and I needed that. I needed someone to believe with me in a world of doubters and people who probably had not seen faith and miracles happen. I know I didn't think that I had, but I wanted to be a part of that. So with nothing to lose, I gave God my faith. It was all or nothing. Putting my faith into action, it meant that I had to not only speak my future, but I had to show it as well. But don't get me wrong, that I was always up in my emotions all the time, that everything just seemed okay. Nope, it wasn't. I had my times each and every day. There were moments in the days ahead that I was so discouraged and that so many tears produced as the doubting thoughts in my head, they whirled around as well as the words spoken to me from my husband that at times could crush my hopes and my spirit. But not for long. For I was learning how to react and what to do whenever he began to get responses from me that shot down his. In those tough daily moments, I would go to God crying and I would pick up my Bible and I just started reading it out loud from any place in the Bible. I just opened it and whatever page was there, I read it until I felt a peace come over me. And you know what? Peace came every time. When my husband had first left me, I was so mad at him. I made sure that he left nothing behind. And all the places where his clothes used to be, I pushed mine in the closet to fill it up. And I placed mine in those empty drawers. And then I read God's word in Hebrews. Boy, was that something. Where it talks about that our faith without our actions is dead. What this meant was I had to activate my faith by showing God that I believed that he was going to do what he said he would. This chapter taught me that God needed me to do my part so he could do his. I had to live on the word of God by speaking it and acting it, speaking things that were unseen, but one day would be seen. Things that were not, I was to live as if they were. Now in my faith, I found myself making room again in my closet and in those drawers for my husband's things to come to. After some of his hurtful words, I had taken off my wedding rings, but now in faith, I put them back on. My baby saw me positively change as the hope was rising up in me. And I prayed with them and over them and spoke positive words to them. And every time that church was open, we attended. It's important to note that faith works in all areas of your life. So when listening to my story, know, know that whatever you are facing, you can begin activating your faith in it. I attended one of the largest churches in the country at the time. And in our department, we had 200 people. And then we broke down into small groups towards the middle of the class time. My married church friends, 
They were older than me because they went by the husband's age, and they were always people that I desired to be like. And one of them in particular, he stepped up to the plate, and because my husband wouldn't return his calls, my friend went to my husband's job, and he crawled underneath a big truck that my husband was working on just to talk to him. And our friend, he really gave him some things to think about. But even after that, most of them carried around some doubt. So that made John's role in my life really important. I needed someone to declare the stand and to stand with me until my marriage was healed or until I felt it was over. I am thankful for their attempt and their help. But one Sunday, in our group, I realized that they had not really experienced any situation quite like mine, and God was really going to do something truly big in my life to show them. They lovingly said to me, We just think that you'll be more comfortable in the singles class. After all, you know, he wants a divorce. I sat there, and for a moment, I gathered my thoughts carefully before I spoke. Looking up and around to everyone in the class, I said to them, I cannot and I will not go to a singles class because God has showed me that faith without my actions is dead. And if I go to a singles class, that would be telling God that I didn't believe that he was going to heal my marriage. I can't tell you when, but I can tell you this. My husband, he's going to come home to me and my children. And one day, he will be back in this class with me. And we will have a testimony in marriage. And we will even be serving in this department. So you can see why. That a person might keep to themselves during this time. They probably thought I was a little crazy. And that that was really stretching it with the whole really big faith thing. So, I had cleansed my house of evil spirits. And I told the devil that he had no right in my home and in our lives. And if you've seen the movie War Room, my experience was much like the character of Elizabeth. Who walked through her house telling the devil off and how he had no right there and kicking him out. I got goosebumps just watching this because it was like deja vu for my experience, which was in the 80s, and this movie came out in 2015. Old Satan, he knew he couldn't come into my home, so now he was coming to me in my dreams, trying to mess with me and showing me that if he wasn't allowed in my house, he would stand outside of it, waiting and trying to latch on to whatever he could in our lives. In the stream, he was standing at my front door, knocking. I went to our door, which was what they called a crossbuck door, with the top half of it being glass. And there he stood with his face pressed up against the glass. And I walked over to the door, not an ounce of fear in my body. And I pressed my face up to the glass directly on the opposite side of the glass where he pressed his face. And I said, in the name of Jesus, get out of my yard. This is how, this is how desperate he was to destroy my life and my family. My potential in this life was so threatening to him that he had to do this that he had to come to me any way he knew how. And I realized that this young woman that I was becoming, who had oftentimes found herself feeling the lesser, was becoming bolder and braver by the day. I loved all that I was learning from my new pastor and the lessons that he had to teach each time. I realized that I finally got it. For his message and how he taught, it was speaking to me. And I was learning. I was becoming who I was meant to be. And with all of that, I felt the need to be baptized again. So I went forward to the altar to begin this new life of mine. My mother-in-law, she appeared in my mind to be one who knew all things God. 
and I discovered that she was missing something. I knew that I had to save a marriage and a family, so I realized that I really needed to talk to my mother-in-law. I asked her to come to my house for lunch, and then I shared with her what I saw. I said, my husband told me, if he didn't have your house to come to, to live at, that he would be home with us. And she said, well, I don't know what to do. And I told her, you tell him to go home. I told her that in Mark 10, 9, God says that what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. I asked her if she knew what put asunder meant. And as she began to think, I said, it means to let no man, no one, separate or take apart or keep apart. Regardless if you or your husband realize this or not, you are contributing to this by allowing him to remain there and not come home and work on this. And God will hold you accountable. I felt that it was important for my husband to be home because there were suddenly those who had wanted us to fail. They were flying around like a bunch of mosquitoes moving in for the kill who simply would attempt to complicate things. The time was approaching for me to be baptized. My parents and my family, they were planning on attending. But also the day before, my husband called me and we talked for a long time. In fact, we spoke on the phone all afternoon. If you ask him, he would tell you that he could hear the change in my voice. There was a confidence in my voice. You see, before, he would come and visit, and he would leave me crying, and God would talk to him on his drive home to his parents' house. It was about seven miles. So then when he got home, he would call and check on me, and he heard a peace in my voice. It really surprised him because here I was, crying my eyes out, and then a matter of moments later, he calls on the phone, and I seem fine. This is because once he left, the first thing I did was I went and grabbed my Bible, barely being able to read the words because of the tears in my eyes. But I did it, and I prayed, and God's peace came over me. It was exactly like like being knocked to the ground and not being able to give up. But instead, just getting back up time and time again, people just keep knocking you down, but you, you just give it all you got and you just keep getting back up. That was having faith in God, that he was doing something, and I had to do my part to activate my faith. I couldn't fail. In that phone conversation, he asked me if he could pick me up and take me to church as I got baptized. So he did. And on the way home, he shared with me that he was coming home. He was coming home because he felt God was telling him to. He told me, I don't really want to come home, but God is telling me I need to go home. We stopped on the way home, and he picked up his stuff, and we met his mother on the road, and we stopped, and he told her that he was going home. And she smiled and said, good. It wasn't a happily ever after ending story, for it took another six months. Six months of me getting my children up and taking them to church in our 17 mile across city traffic commute. Six months of him not going with us. Six months of him sleeping in while we were off to church but we were still going. Six months of him making me mad, but God teaching me. It wasn't always about me. Sometimes God was working on him. God taught me that I had to let him work, and it took time. He told me to put it all at his feet and let him do the work because he was the only one who could change anyone or anything anyhow. So instead of letting out my feelings and starting a fight with my husband, 
I would just go to the bathroom and shut and lock the door and get into the shower and cry it out, yell it out, cuss it out. I could not put it all on the throne and then just keep trying to pull it back into my court. I had to leave it there. I had to leave it there. I went into the shower and I worked on my relationship with my God because he kept telling me, you need to talk to me, he said. I know how you feel, but in order to work out our relationship and work on it, you have to talk to me. You can't stay silent. You have to tell me how you feel. We have to talk. We have to communicate. So I told God. I told him how hurt I was. I told him how mad I was. I told him everything. Everything good, bad, and ugly. He knew it. He heard it. I spoke it. And there it was in the shower, and I had to leave it there and just let God do what God does. I was talking on the phone one afternoon with my mother. And she said, Honey, I don't know how you do it. Always saying I love you, only to hear silence. I then realized that as much as she loved me and she meant well, the old devil was trying to sneak in and have his way of using that opportunity to make me give up. One evening, after those words spoken from my mother, I began feeling so weak, so tired, So tired of saying I love you and hearing nothing back. So tired of feeling that I was like someone's doormat. The thoughts filled my mind that I wasn't worth much, and that's why he didn't love me. That no matter what I had done these past seven plus months, he would never give me the chance that I deserved. I was falling further down into that dark place. But all of a sudden, in this moment, I guess out of habit lately, I cried out to God and I said, Lord, I know that I promised you that I would wait 10 years if I had to, but Father, I am growing weak and I am feeling that I may just have to give up. So Lord, I need you to do something. This is when I learned of God's mercy and I never will forget it and I will be forever grateful I went outside where my husband was working and I told him that I needed him to watch the kids because I had to go pick up some things at the store. I had started my preschool business just to help contribute to our income and I needed some things. And as I was about to walk away, he grabbed my hand and he pulled me closer to him and he began crying and he said, I love you. I have always loved you. I've just been scared, scared to be hurt again. And that is when everything changed. In that moment, it's when God showed his mercy upon me, upon him, upon us, upon our family. And that next Sunday, I will always remember my sweet church group and how every one of them Every one of their jaws dropped open when we walked into that class together and when we began serving as outreach directors of that department. We had couples begin coming to us and seeking help in their marriages. Some worked out while others just couldn't seem to find their way back for one reason or another. But the good news is there is hope and there is help. For whatever the outcome is, there is life because there is always Jesus and he, he will never leave you. Our story continues and in the next podcast, I will be picking up and sharing from here. But I want you to know this, that when you ask God for something, he doesn't give you what you ask for. No, he doesn't. He gives you so much more. He gives you utter beauty. God didn't answer my mediocre prayers. He answered me with so much more. He gave me a marriage, a marriage that's priceless. He gave me a partner that I would choose over and over again. 
He gave me a love that I could have never imagined. He gave me a true best friend. He made everything, everything so much better. He gave me something, something that it took big faith to do. And that set the tone for the rest of my life. I pray that whatever you may be struggling in, that you have taken away from this today, faith, and you begin to feel it rising. For more detailed information on our testimony entitled Marriage, Our Story, and verses to support you in your faith journey, you can find and read it on my website, which is linked in the description on this podcast. You can email me as well at diana at dianahudgens.com. I thank you for joining me today. And until next time, believe. Believe that you are more than a conqueror by doing your part and activating the faith in your life.